Hey everybody, welcome to Local Business Hacks Podcast. I'm your host, Carl Case, and I'm on a mission to help you. Every week we're gonna be talking to local business owners and experts to get their best tips, tricks, and hacks to grow your business. This show's designed to teach you, inspire you, and motivate you to take massive action and start to build your future-proof business. Whether you're just starting off or you're taking your existing business to the next level, this episode is for you. So let's get started. Hey, local business hackers. I'm your host, Director of Global Business Development at Referizer, joined today by Luke Carlson, President of Discover Strength. Luke, welcome to Local Business Hacks, man. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Of course. So I know you, you're rocking about 18 years in the fitness space. Would love to hear from you. What got you to this point and what do you attribute your success to? Yeah, so the fitness is all I've ever known in undergraduate, graduate school in exercise science. I was a strength and conditioning coach in the NFL, loved that work, and was thinking I'm either going to get a PhD in exercise physiology and become a tenure track professor, or I'm going to stay in the NFL. Either one would be great lives, great, great paths. I had a wonderful mentor and friend pull me aside and say, you should think about doing a, a business. You should think about opening something. Knew nothing about business. Got connected to a wonderful entrepreneur that operates one of the or the most profitable health clubs in the world. Uh, flew down and visited with him. And, and he said, hey, read this business book. It was a Jim Collins. It was either good to great, built to last. Read that and said, hey, what should I read next? What should I read next? And within two years, we opened our first location, and that's 18 years ago now. Congratulations on taking advice and obviously funneling through with it. What an amazing book. Luke, talk to us about Discover Strength and just what truly makes you, in my opinion, one of the most unique fitness franchises available today. Yeah, well, 18 years ago, we understood that you have to understand the intersection of three questions. What are you passionate about? Number one. Number two, what drives your economic engine? And then maybe most importantly, number three, what can you be the best in the world at? And if you can't be number one or number two in the category, you should narrow the scope of the category. So today we call this the core business or the strategic niche. So we determined, I mean, it was probably 19 years ago, that all we wanted to do was personalized strength training. So from the day we opened, just one-on-one -on -one and small group, 30-minute workouts, twice per week, strength training. So we don't touch cardio. We don't touch stretching. We don't touch recovery. We don't ever touch nutrition. And it's hard for fitness people to kind of be that disciplined, to stay just in our lane. But by doing that, we're always relevant to the customer, right? If we said, hey, we do fitness, we do personal training. Well, everybody does fitness and everybody does personal training. And of course, I didn't know this 19 years ago, but the studio, the fitness studio category, boutique fitness category is, is the largest growing segment of our industry. I mean, 20 years ago, everybody went to health clubs, you know, 90,000 square foot facilities where you could do anything inside of them. Over the last 10 years, we've seen the emergence of, no, 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 I go to this yoga studio, this Pilates studio, this stretching studio, this CrossFit studio, this boot camp studio, this spin studio. So how do we fit in that landscape? All we do is strength training. Now that works well for us because it's what we're passionate about, right? It also works well because the interest in strength training has only grown over the last 20 years. So that's our whole concept. We just focus on strength training. We try to apply the scientific research to how people should or could strength train. And we try to make it as efficient as possible for them. So it's a 30 minute workout, two times per week. Amazing. And for people that want to get involved, discoverstrength.com. You got it, discoverstrength.com. Amazing. And Luke, how many locations do you guys currently operate in the US? Yeah, so that question is always a tricky question, right? How many are open versus how many are about to open? In the next week, we have three openings. I think right now we have 14 opening, three that will open in the next three weeks. We have 40 exactly, either open or in development. So that the plan is to grow to 100 locations and have those 100 open by the end of 2025. I think that's a really realistic goal to, to get there. Congrats. It's amazing. And I will give my listeners a plug. Luke and Discover Strength are the first fitness brand that I've ever audited to not have a single 
non five star review without using filtering or anything across all Google My Business pages. And that blew my mind. As soon as my team hit me with that info, I was like, I got to get this guy on the show. This is a product and a service that nobody is comparing to. So get yourself into a Discover Strength, check it out and see why, you know, that that is what it is. It's it's incredible. Congrats, man. Thank you. We appreciate that. We take a lot of pride in that. You know, before we opened, I had studied so much on three brands, Lexus, Nordstrom, and the Ritz-Carlton, and we were inspired by those brands. And I thought, I, I, I'm inspired by the idea of providing legendary customer service. But at the end of the day, I like fitness. I like working out more than I like hotels or cars or retail. Love those categories. But at the end of the day, I think a workout truly changes your day and changes your life. So I thought, well, why can't we do that? Why can't we provide the Ritz-Carlton customer experience in an exercise environment? And so that's been our objective since day one. And correct me if I'm wrong, one of the ways that you're doing that is that your trainers are wearing a tie while training. Yeah, all of our trainers, and we call them exercise physiologists because they're all certified exercise physiologists. They all wear a shirt and tie or the equivalent. Generally, males wear a shirt and tie. Females are in dress clothes. They are dressed professionally while they're working with a client. And so that's a little bit of a talk trigger for us, right? So when a client comes in the door, the first thing they think is, what the heck? This is weird that someone's wearing a shirt and tie. And then when they leave, they tell a friend or family member or colleague, hey, I'm working out at this place where they're wearing shirts and ties. So it creates conversation. It's a talk trigger. Now, of course, it's aligned with our brand, the professionalism. It's the idea of ready to serve mentality. Hey, I got dressed and put this shirt on, this tie on, so that I was ready to serve you, ready to serve mentality. So it's aligned with everything we're doing in the brand, but it definitely is a talk trigger as well. Now, we could look good if we wore Nike or Lululemon kind of athleisure. That's a good look. It's just not a differentiated look. So every decision, we want that decision to align with the differentiation we're trying to achieve across the entire brand. Amazing. Amazing. Luke, what else is amazing, I'm sure, is your stories that shaped your business hacks that you love to reteach. So I'm going to give you the mic, take the floor and share us some of those goody, goody stories. So a story that shaped how um, I think about operating the business, growing the business. So... I think firstly, is it's a story around being intentional around the journey that you want to go on. And when you grow a franchise business as a franchisee, as a franchisor, eventually you, you have to decide what journey do I want to go on? And that journey could involve franchising, right? So we knew that we wanted to help develop exercise professionals and we wanted to continue to develop entrepreneurs, owners, leaders, managers. So for us, part of that journey was going to be franchising because we enjoy those things. Part of the journey for me is avoiding private equity, okay? Because that's a, just a different journey. We want to be intentional about that journey. Part of the journey for me is cultivating a relationship based on what we would call vulnerability-based trust with our leadership team. So Thursday and Friday of this week, I have my, I think it's my 10th year in a row of doing an offsite annual retreat with my leadership team. We've done this everywhere. So I'm based in Minneapolis. We've been to Chicago. We've been to Florida. We've been to cabins. We've been to beautiful hotels. We've been to the Ritz Carlton in Miami for this annual retreat where we're with the consultant and we're focused on team health. We're focusing on the strategy and the tactics for the next year and the next 10 years. To me, the journey, that journey, going on that journey with my leadership team, that's as, as, uh, purposeful. That's as meaningful as it gets. And so we'll have a little bit of a lunch tomorrow and talk about, hey, what do we want these two days to look like? How do we make this the best annual we've ever had? So that team that you're going on the journey with, I mean, that really probably defines the journey. So when you talk about hacks or stories, I think it's the first one is be intentional about the journey that you want to go on. So that's number one. My second hack is this is you know, a long time ago, I read the concept that the sign of a company that has a strategy is the leadership team of that company will say no 10 times more often than they'll say yes to the opportunities coming at them. If you say yes on a regular basis, that means you are opportunistic. Well, being opportunistic is antithetical to actually having a strategy. And so we want to have 
strategic anchors that allow us or serve as a filter so that my team, not just me, but my whole team, as opportunities come at us, we know what to say yes to and what to say no to so that we can, after saying no to the wrong opportunities or saying no to actually really good opportunities, just opportunities that are not aligned with our strategy, we can put enormous energy behind the ones, behind the decisions or strategies or tactics that we do choose to move forward with. So if you want to talk about the ultimate growth hack, I always think it's do less, focus more. And that is always a cliche. So you have to have a few ways to actually do that. So to me, it's understand what your core business is. I already said it's personalized strength training. Understand what your strategic anchors are. We have three of them. We're going to use those as filters for everything we do. We're never going to get outside of those in terms of how we allocate resources, time, et cetera. I always think about one of the best ways to prove out are you aligned with your strategy is just look at where your resources flow. And in most medium-sized businesses, the most important resources are number one, capital. And of course, number two, the time and attention of senior leaders. So if our senior leaders aren't focused on these three pillars, we're probably not deploying resources in a way that's aligned with the strategy. So those are my two hacks. Those are my two focuses. Understand the journey that you want to go on. And then number two, make sure you're focused on doing less. And there's a number of ways we can do that. I think we have to understand core business and what our strategic anchors are. Amazing. Luke, is there an example that you've had in your career where you didn't follow those things? And now it's like, hey, I have to do this because I don't want to learn that lesson again. Yeah. So I would say early on, we didn't have this strategic niche, this core business where we said, hey, this is the sandbox that we're going to play in. And we were all fitness people, right? We had undergraduate degrees in exercise science and kinesiology and exercise physiology. Fitness people like all things fitness. I mean, we love all things fitness. So as something came at us, we would say yes to it. So I think like 2007, you know, we had clients come to us and say, why don't you create a training program to prepare for a local marathon? You'll tell us what runs to do. Obviously, we'll strength train to discover strength. Uh, you'll talk about what the nutrition should look like. There can be many seminars involved. There can be all these group meetup runs that we can do together and we can kind of prepare together. We said, well, that sounds wonderful. I, I happen to love running marathons. We should do that. And we did it. And of course, you know, it was a distraction and we weren't good at it. We weren't excited about it. It didn't go well. We felt like we're putting all of this energy and effort into something that's not profitable for us. Our customer could get it anywhere else. I don't think we can do it in a distinctive way. But it, at the time in that meeting, we can make a compelling case as to why it's exciting and why we should do it. So without the filter, without the framework, we made a lot of those decisions. So that's that specific example is 2007. We launched in 2006. By 2013, we have this framework in place so we understand what to say no to. And of course, when we hire new employees, we have to tell them, we're going to say no to a lot of things. And it's not because those things aren't important or exciting, or we don't have passion around them. They're just not going to fit into our framework or our filter. You can still be interested in them. Like I, I ran a marathon. I ran the New York City Marathon three weeks ago. I love all things cardio. We're just not going to do it in our business. And that takes a bit of a bit of discipline to do that. And I think takes the most amount of discipline from the founder or the entrepreneurial leader, because entrepreneurs are constantly distracted by shiny things, or maybe they even get bored with, hey, I've had success in a particular area. I'd love to look at a different area and see if I could be successful there as well. So we like to stay disciplined and stay as boring as possible. <laughs> I greatly appreciate the, the story. I think I can speak from my own personal experience here at Referizer. We launched the entrepreneurial operating system about two years ago. And for those of you that aren't familiar with that, get your hands on the book, What the Heck is EOS? And really learn that process. And now our founder and, and CEO, Andre, I hope, you're, I hope you watch this and reach out to Luke, but it's incredible how we used to be able to sneak things in. Like right now we're getting towards the latter half of Q4. If I want to put something into Q1. It's like, that's not even an option. We can look at Q2 and Q3 as far as development goes. And if two years ago, I would have said, well, there's an opportunity for us to onboard another 10,000 accounts in this, in this sector. It would be like, yeah, no problem. Let's just create a, a cluster 
cluster all over everywhere and ring the alarm. And now it's just everyone really has purpose driven goals and timelines that our culture continually grows because of the transparency and the non urgency that sticks to our core, which is developing and delivering a, a stellar service and product to our customers. It's very, very similar. And sometimes what happens is we trade short term revenue growth for long-term damage of the brand. And so there's a lot of things that I could do in the latter half of Q4 that would drive some immediate revenue, but it would destroy the brand, not even like 10 years from now, but two years from now. And so we just have to be intentional about what are we doing now to drive revenue in a way that protects and strengthens the brand going forward. Yes, 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 yes. Luke, I'd love to hear from you. What does that framework look like? Like, how is that process to get something passed through you and the rest of the the team at Discover Strength? Yeah, I mean, so when we're sitting and having a discussion around what we should try and what we should not try, the first thing we run it through is, does it fit within our strategic niche, the core business, which for us is personalized strength training. So let, let's give an example of that. The pandemic comes along uh, nearly four years ago, all of our studios are shut down and we kick around the idea of doing some virtual personal training, which we had never done before. So of course the first filter is personalized, which means one-on-one -on -one in small group strength training. And we said, would it be personalized strength training if we had somebody at home with a set of dumbbells and a towel and a band, okay? And we train them through a tablet or a screen. And of course, our answer was, we looked at each other. Yeah, that's personalized strength training. Okay, we can do that. That's what we've always done. We're just going to do it through a different medium. And so literally within three weeks of being shut down, we were the largest virtual personal training company in North America. I mean, we were doing thousands of sessions a month. In fact, thousands of sessions in a week. And of course, we did it because we had to, but it aligned with that strategic niche. Now, during the pandemic, pretty extreme example, some companies actually had to change their core businesses because the pandemic didn't allow the core business to persist. We were allowed to persist. We were allowed to thrive, or I shouldn't say allowed, we were capable of thriving within the strategic niche during the pandemic. And so well, a leadership reminder there is when you're going through this kind of tumultuous time, it's good to remind your people what's changing and what's staying the same. And you find out there's more things that are staying the same than you actually realize. And so we walked through, we said, hey, what's staying the same in this situation? We had the same strategic niche. It's still personalized strength training. We're just going to deliver it differently. So that's that's the first filter. The second filter is how does it promote or extend our three strategic anchors? So one of our strategic anchors is efficiency. So the workout has to be efficient. The whole experience has to be efficient. It's a 30 minute workout twice per week, how you schedule, how you park, what your actual workout is, all of those things have to be efficient. So all of our decisions around how do we increase the efficiency for our customer, we are serving a pretty, uh, I should say a higher network net worth customer, like our average customer is paying us $350 a month. So we are serving generally a wealthy client. Now, the reality around wealthy humans is they have the same problems as other people, right? Many of the same problems as other people. And a way to serve that population is provide the same product or service, but do it in a fraction of the time. And so that's that's part of our strategic focus is how do we focus on the efficiency of the workout? And the beauty is there's so much scientific research that says, how little strength training someone can do to still get all of this benefit. That's one of the strategic anchors. Let me share another strategic anchor. It's what we call expert educated trainer. So there's literally a thousand decisions that stem from that. If we're saying expert educated trainer, I'm not telling you our trainer is better than any other trainer. I'm just telling you they're an expert, which means we have to hire people with degrees in exercise science. They have to be American College of Sports Medicine exercise physiologist. We have to have an internal training and development plan to onboard them. So an education team, a core growth plan, we have to send them to conferences. We host a conference every year where we bring in speakers from all over the world just to teach our exercise physiologists. And let me tell you, we lose a massive amount of money on that. And of course, my team looks at me and says, well, we lost $70,000 on that. Does this make sense? And then, of course, we go back to the strategy, the strategic anchor of expert educated trainer. And we uh, always conclude that really it's an investment 
in that strategic niche. We're trying to dig a moat around that anchor. Now, when you think about those strategic differentiators, really those strategic anchors, really what you want is you want those to emerge on a PL, right? I, I know what your strategy is if I look at your PL. If nothing pops out as you're spending a disproportionate amount of money on this, I know that you don't have a strategy, right? We want to barely keep the lights on in some areas of the business. In other areas, we want to invest heavily to dig that moat around whatever that anchor is. So that's the second framework. Is are we thinking about those three strategic anchors? And then lastly, we always like to, to just zoom out and say, okay, that's aligned with our strategy, but how does it impact our customer? How does it impact our employee? How does it impact our bottom line. So every time we make a decision, we just have to think about the impact on those three. And we went through again, the pandemic four years ago, where I think a lot of brands, all different industries, of all different sizes, they made decisions that were focused on one of those constituents and not all three. We saw brands completely lose touch, just ignore their customer because they were so focused on, well, how do we manage cash and how do we deal with the present realities of our, you know, our PL and our situation? Okay. They totally forgot about the customer. And they were even, this is wonderful, thinking about their own people. What do we need to do for our own people? And then we saw other brands be so customer facing, thinking about how are we going to be relevant to the customer? They forgot about their own people. I think most brands do a pretty good job of paying attention to the PL, but you have to pay attention to all three of those. And every time I talk about that or introduce that, leaders think, well, that's so obvious. But we can go through <laughs> case study after case study after case study where brands fail to pay attention to all three constituents. And so we just want to slow down in a meeting and say, how's this going to impact our people? How's this going to impact our client? How's this going to impact our PL? Amazing. Amazing. So congrats, Luke. Uh, happy to know you. Yeah, thank you. I feel the same, Carl. Thank you. Um, we got a little bit of time left. I'd love to dig personally, if that's cool with you. Obviously, Please. you're in amazing shape. You look great. What's the morning routine looking like and how has that evolved over the years? Yeah, well, what a great question. So my exercise takes place all throughout the day whenever it's going to fit in. So sometimes it's a run at 4.30 in the morning on the treadmill. Today, I'm in Minneapolis. It's about 25 degrees outside. I'm going to run outside later today after a dentist appointment at 5 p.m. So each week, I know when are all the workouts going to take place. My strength training workouts always take place at a Discover Strength location, always scheduled with one of our exercise physiologists. So yesterday, I had a workout with one of our newest exercise physiologists at a location that is actually beneath our corporate office. So it's incredibly convenient for me. I rotate to all of our locations that are in the Twin Cities and try to get a workout at all of them. We have a couple locations that are opening, like I said, in the next two weeks. I already have workouts scheduled there because I love to get uh, trained by different exercise physiologists, experience those facilities, get to interact with those, uh, like I said, those exercise physiologists. So my morning doesn't always have an exercise component to it. My morning is wake up. And the first thing I do is a gratitude journal. And it's a, I use the five minute journal product and I just love it. And I save all of them. Uh, this is so nerdy, but two days ago uh, I was reflecting and went back and pulled out five journals over the last three years and just thought about what or actually read about what was I doing on Thanksgiving last year and the year before and the year before, what was I thankful for? What did I have gratitude around? What were all my comments? So I love to save those and go back to those. It's a wonderful practice, the five-minute journal. It literally takes five minutes each morning, and I start my day off uh, with some gratitude. So that is the only habitual thing that I always do, and then the day starts after that. I used to be a long morning routine guy. It was gratitude journal, and then a period of meditation, and then my 30 minutes of reading, et cetera. And I have a, a pretty... I'm pretty emphatic about if it's not serving me, I try to kill it. I, I just don't continue it. And so right now, it's just the gratitude journal. It's not the meditative practice. I still get 30 minutes of audio book every day, but I can do that in the car, of course. So that's what my morning looks like. Thank you. Is there a time that you're up every day by? or it's Yeah, whatever? yeah that, this is one of my favorite topics. You know, it used to be if you weren't up before 5 a.m., I thought you were lazy, I thought you weren't hustling, I thought you weren't grinding. Uh, now, there's just so much research on the importance of sleep for performance, for recovery for an athlete, 
um, but even cognitive function. So two years ago, I bought the Aura Ring that I think has the most sophisticated sleep tracker. And so now I'm obsessive about getting as much sleep as possible. So every day is different based on what my schedule allows. So I'm a Minnesota Vikings fan. The Vikings played on Monday night football last night. I knew I was going to be up later. So it was up till 1030 last night. It was going to be a wonderful time for me to get eight hours of sleep. So my alarm did not go off this morning until exactly 7 a.m. Okay. Before I would think that's blasphemy. That's, you know, I'm the laziest person alive. That was my Tuesday morning, a 7 a.m. alarm. My alarm Monday morning was set for 4.20 a.m. because I had a really early, my first commitment of the day was 5.30 a.m. and I need to be up and showered and ready to go. So every day is just a little bit different. I'm pretty obsessive about being scheduled. I mean, almost every 15 minute period of my day is scheduled all day long, including weekends because, man, I want to suck the marrow out of life. And so to me, what I've found is you got to schedule and get all the things in. And, you know, someone might say, well, don't you want just some downtime to be spontaneous? And I say, well, yeah, but we just have to schedule it, right? Let's get a two hour block of spontaneous uh, time or downtime. So uh, I love to have the day scheduled, but my start of that day could be very different based on the day. Amazing. I'm uber curious. Have you read the book, Buy Back Your Time by Dan Martell? No, but I'll, I'll put it on my list right now. Yeah, he's the 15 minute king, like having everything scheduled in 15 minutes. I've been doing that now for, it'll be a year in December. So we're pretty close to that. Um, Wow, has my life exponentially grown since having that discipline in my calendar. And it actually opened up so much more for me to spend time with family and friends because instead of allotting six hours to spend with one person, I could be there for three hours and then schedule to be with someone else. And they're like, well, you're always so exact. And like, listen, there's, there's only one of me to spread around. Don't you want a little bit of it instead of nothing? So I I definitely resonate well with, with the 15 minutes. Yeah. I'm going to jump on that book right away. Thank you for that recommendation. Yeah. Speaking of books, I know you're an avid reader or have been in the past rattle off some of your like absolute must haves. Here's some gifts for you guys listening. Yeah. So you're right. I'm just obsessive about books. So my routine is 30 minutes of audio book every day. Every Saturday, it's three hours for the physical book. And I'll get that three hours in regardless of where I am. I'm going to find a way to get that three hours in. So I love reading. A couple of my favorites, maybe in my top 20 list, there's a book. I'm going to get the title a little bit wrong. It's about your internal self-talk. And the book is what to talk about when you talk to yourself. Okay. Staple book. I love everything by Jim Collins, but my favorite Jim Collins is Beyond Entrepreneurship 2.0, I think is a wonderful book. Danny Meyer, the famous restauranteur in New York City, uh, wrote a book called Setting the Table. It's one of the best leadership or management books that I've ever read. And it just... Danny is so, um, you feel like you're on a walk and just talking with Danny as you read that book. So that's one of my favorite business books of all time. Largely inspired by all of Patrick Lencioni's book, my favorite Patrick Lencioni book. He originally titled Three Signs of a Miserable Job. I refused to read it because I thought anyone that says they have a miserable job is complaining and you know I had no interest. He retitled the book the truth about employee engagement. I didn't know he retitled it. I bought that book and I opened up the front jacket and said, this book is three signs of a miserable job. It's just been retitled. That might be my all time favorite book. It's written as a fable. And so it's just a fascinating read. It reads like fiction. It is a wonderful book. Those are a a few of my favorites, but I, I truly think that we are shaped largely by the people we spend time with, right? We are the product of the five or 10, whatever the number is, people that we're most frequently surrounded by, I believe that, and by the books that we read. And so I find myself, I mentioned the gratitude journal before, I find myself writing in the gratitude journal literally every few weeks that I have gratitude. I am thankful for books to inspire and to inform me. I just feel like I've been so shaped by the books that I read. So yeah, I'm just an avid reader and and, uh, always excited about the next book. Thank you. I got to ask you, if you're having dinner with a historical figure from the past, who are you eating with and what are you talking about? 
Yeah, it's Abe Lincoln or it's Winston Churchill. I'll just say Abe Lincoln. So Abe Lincoln is kind of a presidential hero of mine. I've never viewed myself or I've never been excited about, oh, I want to be an entrepreneur, but I've always been excited. I mean, since the sixth grade about being a leader. And so how could I lead more effectively? And to me, uh, Abraham Lincoln is among the greatest leaders and forget the context. He's just truly a great leader of humans. And so I would just love to hear his story and talk about the fact that you grew up in rural Illinois, poverty. You would walk six miles in one direction to get your hands in a copy of a book where you knew if you read that book, it could it would shape your life. And how did you tr- how did you transfer your personal ambition that you had from the time you were in elementary school to an ambition that was for a cause, right? How did you change to being uh, this purpose-driven leader that you became? And how did you adopt the communication style? How did you, you know, want a cabinet filled with people who would disagree with you? And what did those conversations look like? So Lincoln would be the person that I would love to have dinner with and be influenced by and hopefully become more and more Lincoln-like. It's awesome. It's awesome. Thank you, Luke. I greatly appreciate you coming on, sharing this wealth of knowledge and stories with us. Beyond excited to see Discover Strength in South Florida and every market that I travel to. And just really proud of, of what you guys are creating and sticking to your basics. It's incredible. Congrats. Well, much appreciated. Great to get to connect with you, Carl. Thank you for the opportunity. We'll see you guys on next week's episode of Local Business Hacks. Make sure to drop Luke a follow. Luke, what's the best place? LinkedIn, Instagram? I would say Instagram. Yep. Luke Carlson 3070 on Instagram. And obviously our, our website is uh, discoverstrength.com. Sweet. Thank you, Luke. Thanks, Discover Strength. Thank you so much. That's it for this week's episode. I hope you found it helpful. Be sure to head over to our site, local-business-hacks.com to check out the show notes and send me questions or ideas for future episodes. If you want to grow your business, just like the people you've heard from here, follow Local Business Hacks podcast and tune in for new tips, tricks, and tactics. Until next time, thanks for listening and keep hacking.